Welcome to it, sports fans from the bleachers back with you again. We've had a little break, but we are back. So back uh, for the rest of the week and throughout the festive season. So welcome to it. The breaking news, of course, Jose Mourinho finally, finally, they've let him out of his misery. Man United have sacked Jose Mourinho. That news coming out this morning around 9.30 or so. So we'll talk about that and unpack a little bit of that. I've spoken about it before. But we'll unpack exactly what happened today and what I think really led up to it. We'll also talk today about uh, Luka Modric, of course, since we've last spoken, since From the Bleachers has been with you. Luka Modric has been crowned World Player of the Year. I'll give my breakdown of what I think of the Ballon d'Or Award, indeed this year and in years past. Rather perplexing, but we'll get into that. And then lastly, I'm a huge Test Cricket fan. Absolutely love the purest form of the game. Maybe I'm getting old. But the pro is once again, no five test match series in South Africa. And a very confusing fixture list. Very confusing. So we'll talk about that, the pro fixture list. We're going to talk about Luka Modric being crowned World Player of the Year. Indeed, in the Ballon d'Or. And we are going to start off at the Theatre of Dreams. Some say Theatre of Nightmares. That'll be we, where we go first. Remember, follow us on on uh, YouTube. You can find us at the From the Bleachers podcast. Otherwise, you can find the FT from the Bleachers FTB TV podcast on iTunes. Find it below in the comment section. Let's get into it. Oh man, I've missed it. I've really missed it. Boiling hot in Cape Town, by the way. Cape Town, South Africa, being absolutely stunning, but boiling. Super, super hot. Tell you what got too hot, the seat at Old Trafford. The managed seat at Old Old Trafford, vacant again. Mid-season, the second manager in a row to be sent packing. To the 18th of December, Jose Mourinho had came through that his time is done. You know, have you ever seen... And I, I see it often. Maybe it's because I don't have a life, but I see it all the time. When I see a couple and I think, wow, they're perfect. You know, he's a, he's a successful lawyer. She's a chartered accountant. You know, he's got a six pack, chiseled arms. She's got the perfect hair and the washboard stomach. He drives a BMW. She drives that Mercedes SUV. You know, the couple on the, on the sort of superficial side, they're perfect. The kids are at private school. Everything is going well. Kids are in the A team at school for sport. In my country, cricket. It may be rugby where you live. But the kids are all in the A team and they're A students. You're thinking, perfect. The surface tells you, perfection. They're made for each other. They work hard. Both mom and dad working hard. Son, daughter at school, cracking on. And then you go on and you hear said perfect couple is divorced two years later after you had met them. And you think to yourself, what happened there? Both parents had great jobs, driving power cars, power jobs. Kids are perfect, superficially speaking. And you think to yourself, what happened? Both parents are successful. What's the issue there? You know, we forget that in order to be successful, right? You have to mold yourself, right? You have to grind and graft yourself incremental moments over years. It doesn't happen in a moment. It happens over years. In order to be successful, you've got to grind and graft and shift and mold yourself and be malleable for a certain time until you find a mold that works for you. And we call that repetition. And that repetition generally leads the top guys to success. And when they find their method, they generally calcify in that mode. Right? So most people, they grind, they graft, they mold to turn themselves into a successful machine. When you've had success consistently at the very top level in I don't care what, sport, business, psychology, whatever it may be, whatever factor of life, when you've been to the top and you have been the creme de la creme, it is 
almost impossible to change. Very few can do what they call, it's called the pivot, right? You need to pivot. No matter how successful you are, there comes a point when you must pivot because the market will dictate that. See, when you haven't been successful, this is the other side of it. When you haven't been successful, you don't know what it takes to be successful. Right? You don't know what it takes to be successful. And relationships are extremely hard anyway. Right? Especially if there's kids involved. Because kids can be in inconsistent up and down. Parents have to keep an eye on them. And, the, you know, if you're successful, you generally have the job and you, you, you got to commit your energies there. But kids bring a different element. And some children get out of hand. And they exacerbate any sort of relationship which parents and families try to have. I know this because I come from a home of divorce. Right? I come from a home of divorce. Petulant children don't help. And trust me, I was that guy. I know we, we're PC now in this world and we can't really say that. It's not the kid's fault. We shouldn't say it. But petulant children don't help if there is tensions at home beneath the surface. I don't care how, how your six pack is. I don't care what BMW you drive. When the kids are petulant and things are strained with your wife or husband, it only goes to exacerbate a difficult situation. It's not easy for anybody in a relationship. You know, the sacking of Jose Mourinho has always been framed as on its way. But of course, it was Jose and Pogba. That's always been how the media sort of framed it. I mean, I followed this story really closely. I found it very interesting. But you know, it's always been Pogba against Mourinho. Pogba, Mourinho. And this is where I've disagreed with them. And I'll discuss tomorrow why I think they shouldn't have sacked Mourinho, but they should not have sacked Jose Mourinho. I think they left it too late in the season. But tomorrow we'll discuss wrong and right. Today we're, I'm just going to unpack where I believe things broke down for Manchester United. So the, the sacking of Jose has always been Pogba versus Jose. Could that work? The millennial superstar Adidas pinup boy, Man United, of course now sponsored by Adidas, versus the old dog that couldn't be taught any new tricks. Rigid. 4-5-1. He wants discipline. He wants an Essien, Lampard-style midfielder, Manish. We know the type of midfielders he likes. Zanetti. He likes the guys that go up and down. No Instagram. No flair. No haircuts. He always likes the guys he knows will deliver 7 out of 10 on their worst day. No flicks and tricks. That's how it's been framed. Pogba's captioned this tweet, of course, didn't help. And they've tried to sort of nerdle their way out, have Adidas and Pogba. And it was a scheduled tweet. But then 10 minutes later, they deleted it. So I think they could have handled that better. They could have handled it better. They shouldn't have released the tweet at all. But that's okay. Pogba will have his excuses and he'll say it was Adidas that did it, even though it was his page and his, his uh, social media team. But okay, that's not going to help. Anyway, the real problem here for me is it was always Jose versus Ed Woodward from the beginning. Pogba had nothing to do with it from the beginning. Let me frame it to you this way. In 2004... Jose Mourinho absolutely shocked the world. We remember him, the famous run at Old Trafford. He ran to meet his players, all the way to the corner flag, and the rest is glorious history. Because in 2004, that Porto team didn't just beat Manchester United, they went on to the final, defeated a now, we know in hindsight, with all the quality that came out of that Monaco team, they went and beat them in the final, and Jose Mourinho has gone on to be the managerial talent of his generation. You know, there, there is nobody who is anywhere near him. He is the best, bar none. Jose Mourinho's record 
is untouchable in his generation. Including Pep Guardiola, by the way. Including Pep Guardiola, Jose Mourinho is as good. If not better, he's done it in more countries. You don't have to like the style, but Jose has been great everywhere. So for me, it's always been it's been Jose against Woodward from the very beginning. In 2004, he shocked the world. And what followed was three Premier League titles, two Serie A titles, a La Liga title, another Champions League title, a league title after leaving Porto, right? So that, that Champions League title was after he left Porto. He did, he did that in Inter Milan. He won the, the, the two Serie A titles and the treble, the very first and the only Italian team in forever to win that treble. And then remember, he already had two Premier League titles. That being the Portuguese titles. That's Jose Mourinho's record in the last 15 years. At age 41, Jose Mourinho had already won the Champions League, what we now call the Europa League, and he had already won titles. At 42, he'd already won the Premier League title and a few cups in England. At age 41, Ed Woodward was just becoming the CEO of Manchester United. At 41, Jose Mourinho had won the Champions League, the Europa League, and by 42, he already had a Premier League title, which made that the third title of his career. So at 38, he won his first title, the Primera title in Portugal. By 41 years old, he was champion of Europe and untouchable from there. In his very own words, he is not just another one in the bottle. He is a special one. Aged 41 years old. At 41, Ed Woodward becoming the CEO of Manchester United. An infant, a baby in footballing terms. Now the problem for Woodward isn't that he was young. Isn't that Jose was a protege. It's that he was taking over from the greatest football administrator we have ever seen. David Gill, quite simply, in the modern day, is the greatest football administrator we have ever seen. There's a word that changes everything in life. That word is expectation. We can all perform when the pressure's not on, but when expectation comes into it, Ed Woodward was always behind the eight ball from day one. Woodward was in, in, in trouble from day one. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. First of all, you must remember, he did not choose David Moyes. The United board, chaired by David Gill, where, where Woodward was a part of it, but he wouldn't have had a say because Sir Alex Ferguson and David Gill handpicked what they thought was Fergie 2.0. Now, we'll never know whether Woodward agreed with that decision or disagreed with it. But here's the worst part in life. If somebody else has your fate in their hands, because what happened then was that he didn't pick Moyes, but he had to put up with all the consequences of Moyes. Ed Woodward has been playing catch-up since then. So he didn't pick him, but he had to put up with all the consequences of David Moyes. And I'll tell you what his background is. For those who don't know, much like David Gill, he's a chartered accountant. Anybody who knows any chartered accountants, they hate disorder. I know lots of chartered accountants. I say lots, like four. But what they want to know is everything from A to Z. What is the foundation? What is the alpha? What is the omega? That's what I know about the accountants, the chartered accountants I know. They loathe disorder. But Ed Woodward had been a success before in a different realm. So we shouldn't take him lightly. Because he was at Price Waterhouse Coopers. He was an investment banker at JP Morgan. So he knows success in life. But in football terms, he's been failing. Ed Woodward only knew success before he came to Man United and was appointed the CEO. 
Remember being an investment banker and having to deal with a man who at your age was the most successful person in the world in his field because there is nothing bigger than winning the Champions League. And at 41, Jose Mourinho can tell Ed Woodward, brother, at your age, I was the king of the world. I wasn't being handed a seat by the Glazers. We know the rest. When Jose Mourinho came in the very first uh, press conference, Jose was saying crazy things from, from right away. From straight away, he said things that worry the United board before. And Ed Woodward could not control him and he let him go. And once the horses have bolted, it is almost impossible to get them back. I always use the analogy, if you want to train a puppy to use the toilet, to use the bathroom, you've got to train it while it's a puppy. Because when it's three, it's already weeing in the house and it's too late. It's too late. You cannot train a dog at three years old to whiz outside. Jose was already saying crazy things in his first season. What Ed Woodward needed to do was get him in-house and say, this is Manchester United. You can get away with all of that noise wherever you've been before, but not here. But once again, at 41, Jose Mourinho was the king of the world. At 41, this was the first time Ed Woodward had been the CEO of Manchester United. And I think here was the biggest challenge for Ed Woodward. And the Manchester United board and the club itself. Never in the history of the modern, the modern history of the club, post Busby, have Manchester United had a manager that is equal in stature or bigger in brand than the club. Right? Remember, Jose Mourinho has as many Champions League titles as Man United have in the modern era. Before he came to Manchester United. He's won titles everywhere. He's a massive brand. He's everywhere. You look at every single Jaguar advert. Any, any of these big adverts, Jose Mourinho is the guy. He is synonymous with football. The, the football manager games, Jose Mourinho was themed for three seasons in a row, I think it was. So Manchester United have not had a manager who is as big as or bigger than the club as a brand ever. And people will say, what about Sir Alex Ferguson? Remember, Fergie was brought in-house. He grew with the club. He didn't come to the club as Paisley. You know, he wasn't Paisley. He wasn't Sir Alex Ferguson then. He was just the guy who'd come from, uh, from Scotland. Who'd won, who'd won it with Aberdeen. So he was grateful to be at Manchester United when it started. Sir Alex grew with the club. Jose Mourinho arrived and he didn't need Manchester United to be the biggest name in the world. He was already the biggest name in the world. And I don't think Ed Woodward was ready for that monster. That for me is where he got it wrong. Woodward early on should have been doing his diligence. What was his behavior like at Real Madrid? He should have been speaking to guys at Real Madrid. What's he like? What does he want? What does he demand? What, how do you control him? He should have been speaking to the guys in the Serie A. How did Inter Milan control him? What do you say to him? What does he expect? What does he bring up front? Because Ed Woodward, really, it looked like that first season, that first transfer window was a mess. They were just spraying at everyone. They got Lindelof, which was like their fourth option in the second season. Bailly, we know, wasn't their first option. I mean, it was an absolute mess. Jose Mourinho is the first manager that's equal to or bigger than Man United as a single brand in the, in the globe of football. Mourinho does not need Manchester United and Manchester United have never, ever had that. The board weren't ready, and Woodward was nowhere near ready. You know, when parents are fighting, petulant children don't help. Pogba isn't the reason Jose failed, but he certainly accelerated the process. Let's be fair now. Pogba's, 
he's clearly, you know, arrogant, self-obsessed, which is fine. By the way, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. What I'm saying is his ability is probably not as high as his social media output. I think that's fair to see. I've spoken about what I think about Pogba as a player. I'll speak that about that again. But Pogba isn't the reason Jose had to go. But he accelerated the process. He's petulant, self-obsessed. And at Manchester United, that doesn't work. Because it's always been a manager-centric football club. And for Pogba to now come in and think he can be the biggest player, when not even Roy Keane could, su- could surpass Sir Sa- Alex Ferguson. Fergie let even Roy Keane go. He let Jaap Stam go. He let Ruud van Nistelrooy go. He let Cristiano Ronaldo go. He let David Beckham go. Nobody from inside of the dressing room as a player has ever tried to be the biggest brand at Manchester United. David Beckham tried. He was on the next train home. He was at Real Madrid quicker than you could say scary spice. They all tried. They came up against Fergie on the board. And they all lost. They all lost. Pogba tried. And it didn't work. And I don't think it's going to work out for him in the long term. But you cannot have a player at Manchester United. Thinking they are the biggest person at the football club. Ultimately. It wasn't Pogba Jose. Ultimately though. It was Jose and Woodward's inability to get along. Which ended it all. It's a sad divorce for a great football club and a football manager who I think got a rough ride. He had an incompetent CEO. He had a petulant superstar, not as a player, but a superstar in the world of football. And that mess didn't help anybody. The board wasn't ready. I don't think Jose Mourinho came in ready. We saw he lived in a hotel the whole time. So maybe Jose wasn't all in anyway. Nobody gets married to get divorced. But now it is over. Man United are a shambles. And it is unfortunate. So, a couple of weeks ago. Is it two weeks ago? I don't know. A couple of days ago. Woke up and I got uh, some messages from friends saying, look who won World Player of the Year. And I was ill. I was physically ill. Because I've always told everybody uh, this award is, is absolute nonsense. And I've known this since 2006, by the way. So it's not me just saying it now. It's not in hindsight. I'm telling you, I've been saying this award is nonsense. They need to cancel it. It's pathetic. Because it's not objective. Let me tell you why. Let me put it to you this way. You ever been exposed to a situation in life where you thought, how did the world conspire to give us this? Like, you, you you ever seen something like that and you thought, how did the world conspire to give us this? Like, You know, it used to happen to me all the time. I'll give you an example. Let me give you a real life example. Whenever people would see me and my and my ex girlfriend, like the people who who claim to love me, would say, "Has she seen your face? Like, does she know you look like that? Because look at her. Like, what is going on here? You know, (laughs) this is the type of things that the people that claim to love me would say. It would be like, what is? How has this happened? She was stunning and I was me. And I'm me. I like <laughs> You know, sometimes you just look at situations and you're like, how has this happened on this planet in the third dimension? You know? Like like surely it's impossible. Like, did I take the red pill? Like what has happened to make this appear in my in what I can perceive? It happened to me. My ex girlfriend. Far too good looking for me. And people weren't shy to let me know. I'm just telling you. These things happen. And if you, if you don't think it happens, you're, you're lying. Because you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you just think, what? How did he end up with her? Or how did she end up with him? 
But it happens. We move on. Well, I want to tell you a story. Uh, so this horror story, right? This horror story begins in Switzerland on the 10th of January in 2011. On this fateful day, Leo Messi was handed his second of four consecutive, right, Ballon d'Ors, which is the World Player of the Year, for those who don't know. 10th of January, 2011. Leo Messi was crowned the World Player of the Year for the second time. So naturally, one would think, of course, he won four in a row, and he is, I think it's undisputed. Not I think, it is undisputed, he's the greatest player of all time. Right? He's objectively the greatest player of all time. So what's the problem here? Like, what, what are we talking about? Well, let me tell you, right? Let me tell you why this farcical award was exposed for what it is. A joke. It's an absolute joke. It's a joke. But the Ballon d'Or, now this year, has officially proved. In 2006, I thought, yeah, they're taking the mickey. 2010, I thought, okay, what are we doing here? Right? Like, do the sponsors decide what's going on here? They tell us the journalists vote and the international managers vote, but I don't think they're the only people that vote. I don't trust it. Right? So the horror story continues. January the 10th, 2011. Leo Messi, World Player of the Year. In tw you know, in Barcelona's 2008-2009 treble season, right? And this is possibly the most mesmerizing season we've ever witnessed in the, in the history of football. Xavi Hernandez got 22 assists in the league. Seven in the Champions League and two in the World Cup. So the 22 assists in the league made him by, he was double. He, got, he had double Juan Mata stats. I think Juan Mata had about 13, so just under double. He had seven assists in the Champions League. That made him the most assist in the Champions League. This is all in one season, by the way. They did the treble that season. League, Copa del Rey, Champions League. 22 assists in the league, seven in the Champions League, two in the World Cup. So the most in the Liga and the Champions League, and then second in the World Cup for assists, Xavi Hernandez. Andres Iniesta in 2010, right? Scored the World Cup final winning goal. I was there. I was there in Johannesburg at the stadium. I saw it with my very own eyes. I saw it. How do I know I saw it? I was there. For those who haven't followed what is happening here, Barcelona won the treble in 08-09 and were dominant in the 2009-2010 season, ending with Spain winning the World Cup in 2010. So that's basically why Leo Messi won that 2010 award. Because, you know, over those sort of year and a half, for those who don't know... The, the, the award, so let's say for 2010, you'll be awarded that for really the 2008-2009 season. So the, the, the sort of year and a half or year before they award that award. You don't necessarily need to be the best in 2010, as happened here. So the Ballon d'Or is awarded for the year and a half preceding, generally. But let's say a year, eight months before they award the award, not after. So Barcelona won the treble in 08-09. They were dominant for 09-10. And it ended with Spain winning, of course, at the end of the 2009-2010 uh, season. Spain won the World Cup. Not the treble that season for Barcelona, but they'd come from the treble season. Won the league again. And they didn't win the Champions League. But Spain were unstoppable. Of course, flooded. Flooded with Pique. Sergio Busque. Next to Xabi Alonso. Coming through. Xavi, Xavi Hernandez. Andres Iniesta. Unbelievable team that. Basically the Barcelona core. Astonishingly. <laughs> Messi was crowned the best player on earth. Even though Xavi and Iniesta had won all of the same titles in the previous two seasons. And a World Cup. In which Messi was awful by the way. Where they got absolutely humiliated by, by Germany. 4-0 in the quarterfinals. What is my point here? Like, how on earth do they decide who the best is? Right? Because if it's league titles, 
then Fabio Cannavaro in 2006 shouldn't have been crowned World Player of the Year because he came from a club where he didn't win a single title, not a cup. Yeah, they won the World Club Cup, but that's not real. So they didn't win a league title at Real Madrid. They didn't win a cup title. They didn't win a Champions League, but he won the World Cup, right? Remember, Nesta got injured, Cannavaro stepped in, and the rest is glorious history. Right? So he didn't win anything for his club. Zero. No titles. So if the World Cup does count, either Iniesta and Sh or Xavi should have won the 2010 award by that logic. If the World Cup matters that much. Because remember, in 2006, let me make it clear, Fabio Cannavaro won the award just for winning the World Cup. He didn't win a league title. He didn't win any titles at Real Madrid. Zero titles that season. No silverware. No silverware with Real Madrid. Right? But because of the World Cup, he won World Player of the Year as a centre-back. By that logic, if the World Cup counts, because that's telling me the World Cup counts, then surely Iniesta and Xavi, because they won the same team prize and Xavi was the maestro behind it all, who had the most assists in the treble winning season in the league, right? And the Champions League and the second most in the World Cup. So by the logic of the World Cup counts so much that Cannavaro can win the award just based on winning the World Cup, surely a team that has, or players that have won as much as Messi in 2010, either Iniesta, who scored the World Cup final winning goal, or Xavi, who drove, who was the absolute cog and engine and the captain of the team that Messi was in, should have been the, the World Player of the Year. Surely, because they've got the same prizes as Messi and a World Cup. And there were star players in the World Cup team. It's not like they were fringe players. If the World Cup... So, either the World Cup counts or it doesn't. This must be clear. Right? And here's why. And this is where... This is the crescendo. This is where the madness actually sort of goes into... Like... Like a sub... Subterranean darkness like this mental ridiculous world of what is happening right here's why it matters why it has to be clear because the nightmare the crescendo of this nightmare <laughs> is that in on december the 3rd in 2018 luka modric right was crowned the best player on earth having won only the champions league that's all you want. And I tell you, people might go, oh, well, the Champions League's huge. It was their third one in a row. Yes, but Cristiano Ronaldo, so here's the problem. Cristiano Ronaldo, by his standard, had an absolutely shocking season and scored 44 goals in 44 games. So he won the same prize as uh, Luka Modric and was the top goal scorer in the Champions League. And he was the second top goal scorer in La Liga. He was in the same team as Luka, as Luka Modric. Modric didn't win anything else. And just like for Mo Salah, I'm not handing out an award for congratulations for getting to the World Cup final. There's, that's nonsense. Trust me, my international team, I'm South African, but I support Croatia. But he got to the final. He didn't win it. I mean, international football is nonsense anyway. They should probably just cancel it. But that's a conversation for another time. But why are people giving Modric an award for getting to the World Cup final? I don't want to hear that. Cristiano Ronaldo won the same amount of prizes and was a far more critical part of the Real Madrid team that won the treble because he scored the goals. So he won the same prizes last season as Luka Modric. So this I just don't understand. Right? Because this is the way we need to clear up whether the World Cup matters or not. This is why it needs to be clear. Because Cristiano Ronaldo was on the same team as Luka Modric. Right? So won all of the same things as Luka Modric. He was the Champions League top goal scorer, which they won. And he was the second top goal scorer in La Liga. And Cristiano Ronaldo also didn't win the World Cup. So, what are we talking about here? Even worse, Leo Messi, 
right? Won the domestic double and was the top goal scorer in the league. They won the league and the Copa del Rey, right? And Leo Messi also didn't win a World Cup. Just like Luka Modric, Leo Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo didn't win a World Cup. So what, what annoys me is, does the World Cup count or not? Like, can we just be clear on that? Because like I'm telling you, if the World Cup does count, fine, then I'll accept that Cannavaro should have won the award in 2006. But if the World Cup doesn't count... Right? Or, or if the World Cup does count, I'll accept the, um, excuse me, I'll accept the Cannavaro Award. But then I can't accept Xavi not winning World Player of the Year in 2010 because he won the same prizes as Leo Messi and a World Cup. Right? So what are we doing here? Like, what are we doing here? Messi won the domestic double last year and he also didn't win a World Cup and he was a top goal scorer in La Liga. And he got, again, he got like 46 goals. Like, what are we doing here? World's best player. Luka Modric is even the best midfielder in his team. Like, everybody can see, anybody who's watching, it's the Tony Cruz show. Come on. Come on. The Ballon d'Or has been a joke, and I've said it since 2006. I promise you it's not in hindsight. I am delivering the gospel to you. In saying, just cancel the award. Seriously, just cancel the award. Because it's fixed. I'm sorry, somebody has to say it. It's fixed. It's a sponsor's thing. And clearly there's some, there's some Ronaldo Messi fatigue. It's madness to suggest that Luka Modric was on the same level as Messi last year. He wasn't. And I think it's madness to suggest, and I love Leo Messi. I'm a Real Madrid fan, but I love Leo Messi. I, I know, he's the greatest player of all time. But Ronaldo was king last year. He was the top goal scorer in the Champions League, and they won the Champions League again. So if you're going to give it to anyone, you give it to the guy who's the catalyst, not an assistant. It's a joke. It's like the, the media is trying to be too clever now. You don't have to be too clever. Ronaldo's clearly the best. You don't have to make anything up. The Ballon d'Or is the Ballon d'Or joke. Ballon d'Or, it's not a valid prize. It's terrible. Cancel it. Let's find a new way to do it. Objective. Let's be objective, right? My goodness. Ronaldo rightly didn't pitch up, as far as I'm concerned. He was dead right not to go. And Messi was dead right not to go. It's farcical. Absolutely farcical. You know, it's farcical. Speaking of absolutely outrageous my favorite topic our all you know what if you're south african it's all of our favorite topics the pro tears like sa cricket you know let, let, let me put it this way sa cricket and i have this relationship yeah or, or let me let me see if you've ever had this type of analogy in life right it's not literal but i'm sure you've had people like this come into your life you ever had someone save you uh, from drowning? And then they expect to thank you, right? Even though they're the ones that pushed you in the water. Like, whew, nearly lost you there, man. Thank goodness I got there in time. Like, dude, you pushed me in the water. What are you talking about? Get out of here, sucker. <laughs> you, ever, you ever met those type of people? Like, dude, I saved you from drowning. Like, dude, you pushed me in. What do you want to thank you for? That's, IC, that's the ICC and, and Proteus Cricket. I'm sorry. Listen, I don't care how good any sportsman in the world is. I just do not care how good you are at sport. If you don't get time to get your rhythm, we call it form. I don't care how great you are. You will never be able to, to give me your greatest performances. I don't care how great you are. If you don't get the time to prepare and get what we call rhythm and us sports fans call form, you can never give me the best performances you've got. So once again, cricket has sold the fans short, right? Once again, South African cricket is, is selling us short, along with the ICC. 
And what am I talking about? Am I just ranting? Am I just going crazy today? Like, well, what's going on? Listen here. Pakistan, right, have just been humiliated in New Zealand on slow, low tracks, on those drop-in tracks that they have to have in New Zealand. And now they're coming to possibly the most lively pitches in the world. South African pitches move sideways. I would argue more than English pitches. If you if they use the kookaburra ball, if you don't know what a, if you don't know the difference, they use a juke ball in England, slightly more proud seam, and what that does is create a bit of more lateral movement off the deck. Don't want to get into the science of it. But anyway, we use the kookaburra here in the global south. South Africa has probably the most lively pitches, and by that I mean the ball seems and bounces more than anywhere in the world. Australia probably has the bounciest pitches, but South Africa, the combination of of how hard the decks are, so the ball bounces, and then the ball off the, off the deck moves so much because there's enough moisture in South African pitches. If you bend your back, you'll get a little something out of the pitch, which you will not get in New Zealand. I don't care if you're the incredible Hulk. Low and slow. So those conditions are pretty close, right? They're not quite as dry and dusty, but they're low and slow. They're not as dry and dusty as uh, the UAE conditions, which uh, Pakistan has been forced to play in, uh, I think, the last three years because of security concerns. And they've actually just started playing at home a little bit. But they've got that dry, uh, dusty type of pitches that they have on the subcontinent. But it's similar. And they've just been humiliated by New Zealand, who are average. Humiliated. Innings defeats here and there. I think they won one uh, did uh, Pakistan by an innings as well. But in generally, New Zealand humiliated them. And what's my issue? Where are the fans actually being done in here? Pakistan will have 19 days, including travel in South Africa, to adjust to the seaming tracks, right? And arguably the best seam attack in, on earth. None of the tests are going to go more than four days. I, I don't think any of the tests will go four days. Barring rain. All right? And here's where it gets even more ridiculous. Why is SA Cricket squeezing in a two-test series, all right, with Sri Lanka later in the year, so close to the World Cup? Just turn the Pakistan series into a five-match test series. What you get then is you give Pakistan the first two tests to almost adjust to the pitches. So what they could do is we know they're going to get blown out in the first test, right? We know that. But in the second test, maybe they can play for the draw, go into the third test 1-0, and then we have a test series on. Because when you, when you give them five, because you, obviously we refuse to play touring matches anymore because everybody has to play 18 million 20 T20 matches a year because Susan and the girls need to go and get drinks at the cricket. But okay. Why are they squeezing two tests into the Sri Lankan season? series later in the year it doesn't make sense once again what you do is you con is you add those two tests right so sri lanka comes to south africa just before the world cup what i'm saying is make sure that in this series we play five test match series you give us a great summer of cricket in that sense so the old people like me who can go to the cricket and love cricket are happy because they're, they're international cricketers you give an international cricketer three games to adjust the conditions oh we've got game on and then you never know, South Africa suffers injuries, this and that, a bit of dip in form. One of the, um, one of Ms. Buzz chaps, they, they, they get some form. And who knows, over five tests, then we can see the cream rise to the top. Over three tests, no chance. They don't have any touring games. They have 19 days to come from New Zealand, adjust. And we, we, know, we know what they say. They say you add one day for every hour, right? In terms of adjusting, in terms of jet lag. So you can really call that maybe 10 days that they have here to prepare. 10 days is not enough to, to prepare for the conditions in South Africa compared to the New Zealand conditions. And what you could do then is you, you make it a five test series and then you make, you make it a seven one day series. Because we're preparing for the World Cup. And then what you could do is get back the T20 money when Sri Lanka come here, is instead of a three-match T20, forget the two tests, right? Make it like a six or seven-match T20 tournament, right? And then make it a seven-match 
ODI tournament. And I'll tell you why you do this. You don't need the test so close to the World Cup. You can catch up the test at the end of the year. Oh, excuse me, in January, uh, January moving forward. Because we, we can play now throughout the year. We can play right, right till June. You can catch the tests up. You don't need to play Sri Lanka. You need to prepare for the World Cup. And I'll tell you why I'm so furious about this. It's so wrong for the fans. Because you're not going to get the best T20 product. You're not going to get the best one-day product. You're not going to get the worst of all. You're not going to get the any sort of test product. Because when Sri Lanka come here, they have no time to prepare again. They're coming straight out of another series. Why wouldn't you just play a seven-match ODI series against, against Sri Lanka? Here's the worst part of, of, of this all. They're squeezing in a two-match test series. Well, you can't even call that a test series. They're, they're squeezing in te two test matches for Sri Lanka and South Africa. right? This is just before the World Cup. Just before the World Cup, they're squeezing in two tests, five ODIs, and then before the World Cup, instead of having ODIs and preparing the team, making sure they're sharpest for the England game opener, they have three T20s thrown in there before the World Cup. So the last games the Proteas will play are T20 games. I don't know if anybody's been watching, but the ODI team and the T20 team are completely different. So what's the point there? So if you say, oh, we're going to rest the guys... Why? So now they're not going to be informed. They're not going to play for, what, three weeks before the World Cup? What are we talking about here? What you could do is chop out those T20s and just play a seven-match series, take out those two tests, put the two tests in the Pakistan thing, the Pakistan team, we have a five-match series. Glory, hallelujah, we're prepared for the World Cup, which we'll probably choke in, but that doesn't matter. Uh, I, I don't think the protests are good enough. Uh, I'll speak about it more when we get closer. But it's the World Cup. It's 50 overs. It's not a slogging 20 over thing. Here's what I think's happened, right? ICC need to listen to me. And listen carefully. You don't have to be too clever about this thing. The ICC is getting in its own way. Don't get in your own way, guys. You don't have to be too clever about this thing. Let me tell you how it works. And it will always work. Let me tell you how it will always work. Test cricket is the cake. Okay? Let me say that again. Test cricket is the cake. Right? The ODIs are the icing. And the cherry on top is the T20. Not the other way around. Dave Richardson, ICC... SA Cricket, let me say it to you slowly. Test Cricket is the cake, right? Test Cricket is the cake. The ODIs, 50 over Cricket, is the icing. And the cherry on top is T20 Cricket. Why is that so hard to understand? Give it to me in that quantity. There's more cake than icing. There's more icing than cherry on top. That's the model. Don't try and be too clever. T20 cricket is now getting watered down. The money is around. Don't get greedy. Have a plan. Stick to the plan. Cricket's been here long before T20 cricket. Cricket will be here long after T20 cricket. ICC, SA Cricket, get it together. The money is there, your product isn't. Stop sacrificing Test Cricket for T20. T20 is for casual fans, casual fans don't last. Fix it. Test Cricket the cake, ODIs are the icing, and as it should be, T20 is the cherry on top. Folks, that is it from the bleachers this week. 
or just today actually back again tomorrow we'll be talking a lot more about Jose Mourinho and what's to come I'll talk Maurizio Sarri my thoughts on him and his season so far at Chelsea and much much more remember subscribe on iTunes Follow us on YouTube and give us a like and recommendation. Go and rate us on iTunes. Five stars. I don't want any negative feedback. I don't want to hear the truth. I don't want the objective truth. I just want five stars. Just me and my ego being brushed. That's all. From the bleachers for today, 18th of December. Compliments of the season to everybody. Looking forward to chatting to you tomorrow.